I'm out of healing. Out. There's no more healing. It's fine. Devin, what the f- <laughs> Why I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I really- <laughs> Red, go shoot! <laughs> With Resident Evil 8 coming out this week, I thought it was finally time to review the game that I've been putting off for about three months now, and that's Resident Evil 5, the most controversial game in the franchise. Unless you count Resident Evil 6, but honestly, what's the controversy? It's terrible. And I can't believe people even dispute that. But Resident Evil 5 was truly the moment in the franchise where it indisputably changed into an action game. And so then you have the two sides of the Resident Evil fan base. You have the old fans that mostly hate this game because it represents the downfall of the franchise to them. Especially since Resident Evil 5 has basically no horror in it whatsoever, at least four attempted a horror atmosphere at moments. And then you have the new fans, who likely grew up with either Resident Evil 4 or 5, and prefer the games as action games instead of these clunky, fixed camera, survival horror experiences. So the question is, of course, where do I stand on the issue? I'm pretty much down the middle. I like both sides of Resident Evil, and always have. That being said, I definitely agree that Resident Evil 5 is not a very good Resident Evil game. But I still enjoy it quite a bit. But it undoubtedly has a lot of flaws. So the question is, was Resident Evil 5 really that bad or really that good? Well, unlike with Outriders, I actually managed to get a co-op partner this time around. Though he's not a huge fan of Resident Evil, which you'll be able to tell really quickly. And so now that I have both the single player and the co-op experience fresh on my mind, let's find out if Resident Evil 5 was a worthy sequel to 4, or started the death spiral of the franchise into 6. But before we do, do the things the algorithm likes. You all know what that means. If you'd like to support me directly, check out my Patreon. And without further ado, let's punch some boulders. Yeah, okay, you remember this boss fight, right? No. Okay. Um, nice job. Wait, are you not supposed to shoot her? No, that's Jill. Okay, when in the canon did Jill die? You fake fan. What are you, what are you talking about? I don't even know who the fuck Jill is. What? Oh, what did the canon? You don't know Jill who die? Jill is? Know. You know, only like the main character of two main games. Dad, do you know who Jill is? Yeah, so he knows who Jill is. No, he doesn't. He's just lying to make you feel better. So as with pretty much every other video on the channel, I like to talk about gameplay first. So how good is the gameplay loop, the level design, etc. with Resident Evil 5? Well, it's quite good, but it's definitely not as good as Resident Evil 4. And this is to be expected, because Resident Evil 4 had some of the greatest encounter design in video game history. The, just the sheer amount of variety in the encounters in that game is almost unmatched. Because one of the beauties of Resident Evil 4 is just how simple the gameplay is. You stand still and you aim and you shoot at things. And enemies react based on where you shoot them. And you, if you shoot them in the head or the knees, you can do a combo move on them, which makes you invincible, right? And of course, all of that is still in Resident Evil 5. In fact, it's been expanded on a little bit and the controls have been fine-tuned. It's still tank controls, and you still can't move while aiming, but I'm completely fine with that, personally. I think it works. This is a game about taking slow, precise shots, at least on normal difficulty. The higher difficulties kind of throw some of the main appeal out the window, but that's a discussion for later. It's just satisfying to shoot people because every bullet, no matter how weak, stuns your enemy. So it's just inherently satisfying. And it's just, it's flashy as hell, you know, just to see Chris with his roided out mega arms just uppercutting someone through the air, or, you know, Sheva throwing her whole body into like a roundhouse kick, or all of these fancy moves that essentially make the RE cast into superheroes at this point. There's also a minor quality of life improvement where in Resident Evil 4, when you knocked an enemy down, it was pretty common to use your knife to save ammo. Well, in RE5, you can just stomp on their heads. It's simple stuff like that that makes the game just a wee bit faster paced. And for the few of you who played Mercenaries, you might remember that Hunk could snap people's necks. And that's back in RE5 as well. 
Jill can even snap people's neck with her thighs, which might just be the greatest way for any human to die. Another one of the main appeals, at least to me, of Resident Evil 4's combat system is that every type of gun had a very specific role. This is not going to sound revolutionary. Obviously, all of these concepts have been used in other shooters, but the reason Resident Evil 4 pulled it off so well is because they leaned into them as heavily as possible. For example, the handgun basically only exists to set up combo moves. It doesn't do enough damage to kill enemies in any timely fashion, so basically you just shoot them in the head or shoot them in the knee and then use the combo move to clear out a room of enemies or avoid damage since you're invincible. The shotgun is basically just used for knocking enemies down. It usually doesn't do radically more damage than the handgun. The TMP, which was the only machine gun in RE4, basically didn't really have a defined role. That's been changed in 5, but in 4, it was essentially just the boss killer weapon until you got the Magnum. And the sniper rifle is pretty obvious, it does the same thing as every other game. You can headshot people, and it's an instant headshot kill on any normal enemy. And then finally is the Magnum, which is the boss killer. Very rare to find bullets for, and is just insanely powerful for a handgun, for really no reason. Just because it's cool, and it's been a staple since the original games. So then, what's different in RE5? Well, it's the exact same balance, essentially. The difference is, is that ammo is way more common. If you thought ammo was common in Resident Evil 4, it's even worse here. You will never run out of ammo in RE5. It's never going to happen. Because it has the same variable loot system, but without the scaling difficulty. Because RE4 had scaling difficulty, RE5 does not. So, if you're low on ammo, ammo will always drop. So, the main effect this has on the weapon balance is that now that there's way more machine guns, there's actually no reason to carry a pistol at all. As soon as you get the Scorpion in the first level, you could completely throw away the pistol for the rest of the game if you wanted to. Because it serves the exact same function while also having way more ammo efficiency. Even if it does less damage per shot, it still will stun an enemy almost every time, and then you can just do a follow-up attack and finish him off on the ground. And that's about it for changes, actually. Everything else is more or less the same. You do get a grenade launcher about two-thirds of the way through the game that can't be upgraded, and has a bunch of different, essentially, elemental ammo-type rounds, but it's not necessary at all. I basically don't even use it, because each individual ammo type takes up a slot, and you only have nine inventory slots. Which, yeah, that's a great transition into a downgrade. Resident Evil 4 had quite possibly the greatest inventory system in a video game, and only a few other games have copied off of it, and none of them have done it as well. Deus Ex Human Revolution comes to mind. But no, they completely ditched that for five. Now you only have nine inventory slots, which means that there's no reason to carry more than three guns at a time. You might as well store the rest of the shit away. But the main difference, of course, and this is the thing that everybody wants to talk about when it comes to Resident Evil 5, is the co-op. Because it is the biggest change, it's also probably the worst change, because it's completely mandatory. If you don't have a co-op partner, you have AI Sheva, and she is horrible. Absolutely horrible. Anything you've seen in any other review of this game is true. She's dumb as a brick, wastes ammo, wastes healing items, which I don't think I need to explain how bad that is, is bizarrely slow, because we know the AI could be way faster than this. They purposely cripple her to make her not too good. And outside of a few scripted sequences where they basically just make her do exactly what she has to do, like whenever you split up, the AI will basically do a very specific routine so then it's reliable. But in between all of these sections, all she ever does is get killed or get you killed and waste ammo. Words can't properly describe how bad this is on the higher difficulties. It is absolutely unbearable. You can be bleeding out and it takes her like five seconds, even if she's standing next to you, to revive you. Which many times is too long. Uh, 
Sheva? Sheva? Come on, Sheva! No! Fuck you, Sheva, goddamn! So, like I said earlier, I did get a co-op partner for this. I bribed my brother. Yes, literally bribed him with Pokemon cards, of all things. I just wanted to ask you really quick, do you want me to bring up in the video how I bribed you with Pokemon cards? Sure, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> He's actually not a huge fan of this. He's really not a fan of Resident Evil though in general, so take his opinion with a grain of salt. But our playthrough of this is the perfect example of how this is a much better game if you have a co-op partner. It's not even necessarily that the game has really fun co-op mechanics, it's just that a lot of funny moments tend to happen. I, I don't know, something about the, the wacky nature of this game. Will he come? Yeah. Yeah. I just got knocked uh, into the uh, elevator. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it there. Hope that guy doesn't murder it. He called you a half man. This is <laughs> Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> And this is just one of those games, especially if you're playing it on veteran, which is hard mode. If you're not working as a team, you're gonna get each other killed a lot. It makes for a very entertaining experience. I would highly, highly recommend playing this game with a friend if you can. Even if just to get rid of the shitty AI. And yeah, that's about it. I mean, it's not like a whole lot of things have changed since RE4. The game's just a lot more linear. The level design probably took the biggest hit because of that, and I would blame that mostly on the fact that it's a co-op game, so th the pacing needs to be faster to keep both players entertained, or at least I'm guessing that's what their logic was at Capcom anyway. The only level that breaks the format of linearity is Chapter 3-1, where you can use a boat to drive to any island in any order that you want to go to out of the four. And there's even a, a couple optional little secret areas with extra treasure and an RPG. And so that's probably the coolest level in the game, at least design-wise. It's a shame that there aren't more moments like that. There are a couple moments at least where the game sort of goes off the rails with its design, completely throwing out realism. There's a strange African huge temple section they look like Mayan or Aztec temples but this is Africa not South America so I don't know this is just a classic Capcom just doing whatever the hell it wants like there's a part where there's like refracted sunlight laser beams that set the ground on fire though even here there's no break from the shooting gameplay except for one really stupid laser puzzle that happens a little over halfway through the game I have no idea why they put that in, because only one player can really do it at a time. If both of you tried to do it, you're going to laser the other one to death, which is hilarious. Nice try. You just fucked it up for me, too. How did yeah, I do so. that? The laser is already in the right uh, place there. Okay. Right now, go to the safe place. <laughs> <laughs> that kills you instantly! Yeah. Now, of course, I would say no good game is complete without some solid enemy variety. And this is yet another element where RE5 didn't really change too much from RE4. The Magini replaced the Ganados from 4. They're functionally the same. There's a couple new variants for their mutated, like, Ouroboros, Plagacy type of tentacle shit, but it's pretty much the same concept. And fundamentally, the only difference in how these enemies are used is that there's just like twice as many of them now since it's two players instead of one. And of course, there are some new tougher enemy variants. There's some mini bosses they throw in there. And ultimately, I'd say it's a solid lineup. The only problem I really have with enemy variety is there's not enough BOWs. The liquor betas and the cockroach guys are the only ones in the game that are truly monsters. And that's a little disappointing, you know, the monsters are always the coolest part of Resident Evil, at least to me. And the only other BOWs are the bosses, which of course no Resident Evil game is complete without some memorable bosses. Unfortunately, I think RE5 is definitely on the weak end of the series with these. Half the bosses are straight up gimmick fights, and the other half are either way too easy, or are bullet sponges. 
None of them quite hit the heights of Resident Evil 4, and it would take too long to explain individually why all of them are good or bad. Just know that while there are more bosses than Resident Evil 4 in terms of variety, the quality has definitely gone down, and they've leaned too heavily into defeating them a very specific way or relying too much on quick time events. So not a huge fan of them overall, except for some of the big story moment fights near the end of the game. There is one main gameplay design change in Resident Evil 5 that only appears in the last quarter of the game that I vehemently disagree with because it ruins this gameplay design completely is when the zombies use guns. People probably remember this moment distinctly in their mind. But yes, eventually you come to a part in the game where all the zombies are using assault rifles. And it is, without a doubt, the worst part of the game. Pretty much every encounter design past that point is worse than what comes before it. And it's because Resident Evil's mechanics just don't work when the enemies use guns. Because you have to stand still to aim and shoot, they had to create this contextual cover mechanic where you can only hide behind certain labeled boxes and walls and then you peek out and you shoot them like any other game. The problem is, is that enemies don't die from headshots in Resident Evil, so, well except if you're using a sniper, which you probably should be from this point on, you should be relying on the sniper a lot to get rid of these gun goons. And just in general, it just feels more annoying. The weird thing about bullets is, you know, in Resident Evil 4 and 5, when you get hit by a melee weapon, you get hit heavy, you take a shit ton of damage, it feels very punishing. In Resident Evil 5, with these gun goons, a single shot doesn't stun you. It takes a full burst of them, which it actually, that burst of bullets does more damage than a melee hit. But you can take all of this chip damage before it. It just feels cheap, because there's no easy way to dodge it. With melee enemies in these games, you could run straight past an enemy around them if you timed it correctly and dodged the attack. But with the guns, the enemies can't miss. They always perfectly track you if you're not hiding behind cover, so there's no real way to avoid it. You're forced into a cover-based shooting scenario, which is never fun. And there are certain points where they throw enough enemies in front of you that there's almost no way to peek out and shoot without getting hit. It's not impossible to beat these chapters without getting hit. There are people who have made walkthroughs where they take zero damage for like the whole game, right? But it just feels significantly less fair. These games have always been about cleverly avoiding damage. I mean, in Resident Evil 4 and in this game as well, you could knife a crossbow bolt out of the air. Granted, you're not gonna rely on that, but you can still shoot it out of the air as well if you time it correctly. And it just kind of forces you to play the game in a very specific way that's just not satisfying. And on the higher difficulties, it's almost unbearable. On professional, three bullets knocks you down instantly. So it's just incredibly annoying. So I think I'm going to briefly tackle the story. The story is really dumb, and there's not a lot of events that actually happen, so this shouldn't take too long. Basically, after Umbrella fell, due to the events of, you know, Resident Evil 2 and 3, and after the events of Code Veronica, when Wesker was encountered again, and basically the rest of it is not really that important, you stop some evil twins. This is what you get for trying to oppose me! Now feel my revenge! <laughs> Chris Redfield is working for the BSAA, which is anti-terrorist unit designed specifically for biohazards, of course. Which makes sense in-universe, because there's a lot of BOWs, aka bioorganic weapons. So the BSAA sends Chris down to Africa, because some shit's going down. There's some guy named Irving, who's selling the Ouroboros virus and infecting everybody. And he's assisted by some strange woman in a plague doctor mask. And Chris has come alone because his former partner Jill Valentine, who I'm sure all of you know, died, quote unquote, of course she didn't die, as if that's even a spoiler, in their last mission when they tried to finally catch Wesker at the Spencer estate, which is actually one of the DLCs in this game that I'll talk about later. And so his new partner is Sheva Alomar, who is incredibly hot, as most Resident Evil girls are. I guess that doesn't come as any surprise. And so they gotta team up and track down the source of the Ouroboros virus and... And then you basically just 
fight a lot of zombies for a while. The same type of zombies from Resident Evil 4 because the Ouroboros virus was derived from the Plagueis parasite. Obviously Wesker's behind it. And Wesker is assisted by Excella Gioni, who is the head of Tricell, I believe, which is some other pharmaceutical company that is obviously evil and covering for Umbrella, reigniting some of their old experiments, because apparently they've been around a long time in Africa. Because Africa is the source of the progenitor virus, which was the very first virus that eventually became the T-virus, and is also the virus that created Lisa Trevor in Resident Evil 1. It's all a bit convoluted at that point. And Excella has the hots for Wesker, but Wesker doesn't give a shit because Wesker is a Wesker sexual. So he ain't having any of that shit. And of course, the woman in the Plague Doctor mask is Jill, who's been mind controlled. And you gotta stop her in a boss fight. And eventually, you stop Wesker from becoming a god and spreading the virus across the world. And honestly, not a lot of actual other plot events happen. It's not even really worth talking about. No, honestly, what's way more worth talking about are the actual plot-based boss fights themselves. Especially the ones with Wesker. There's three encounters in the main game with them, and all of them are, are entertaining in their own way. In the first one, you fight both Jill and Wesker at the same time. Sheva splits up to have her 1v1 woman cat fight thing that's in like every movie for some reason. While you deal with Wesker, and it's basically like a hide and seek battle because he has Matrix super speed powers and can dodge bullets, so there's not a lot you can do other than hide and hope to catch him off guard. And basically you have a seven minute time limit in this boss battle. Seven minutes. Seven minutes is all I can spend to play with you. Just run and hide like a coward. Unless you were smart enough to bring an RPG, in which case you can deal with him pretty quickly. Directly after that fight is the big boss battle with Jill, where you have to rip the mind control device off of her chest, which clearly my brother didn't understand. And despite relying mostly on quick time events, that's still a pretty fun little boss fight. Next, way later on, just after fighting your way through a huge gauntlet with multiple minigun enemies, cockroaches, assault rifle, peons, Jill calls you up and tells you that if you inject Wesker with his daily serum more than once, he'll act as a poison. And so, how do you pin down a man with super speed and super strength to inject him with a serum? Well, it's actually surprisingly similar to Metal Gear Solid 4's boss fight against Vamp, for those of you who remember that which I believe released just a year before this, so I wonder if that's an intentional reference. But basically, you gotta take him out, and because Wesker is dumb enough to wear sunglasses at night, <laughs> all it takes is shutting off a few spotlights in the arena, and shooting an RPG into his face, which he catches. You blow up the RPG, either you or Sheva holds his back, and the other just injects him with the serum. Then you have this huge cutscene quick time event thing, sort of like the Krauser boss fight in 4, but you know, these don't work. See, the thing about quick time events in both Resident Evil 4 and 5 is that you can't actually fail them by pressing the wrong button, so you can just press every button and you'll eventually succeed. So immediately after this, the plane crash lands into an active volcano, and to make things even more insane, after fending off Wesker one-on-one -on -one and trying to cover the other and stalling for time, this is where the famous boulder scene comes into play. Basically, you and Sheva take turns running away from Wesker in the volcano and trying to distract him. Sheva gets stranded on a ledge and she needs to pull herself up. And in the meantime, there's a conveniently placed giant boulder that Chris needs to knock over so that Sheva can hop over to your side of the volcano. And so what does Chris think to do? He thinks to fucking shoulder charge that shit and punch the boulder over. This is what I'm fucking talking about. This is pure masculinity. This is why you lift for this scene right here. This, this is the greatest scene of all time. Like this is rule of cool taken to the extreme. This is when Resident Evil became an anime. This scene right here. 
It never quite reaches this level of stupid again, though Jill wielding the giant rail gun in the Resident Evil 3 remake is kind of close. This is just beautiful. It's so bad, it's good. This is like the perfect B-movie schlock stuff that I loved from Resident Evil 4. Where's everyone going? Bingo? That is sadly missing in this game for the most part. They take it way too seriously. But this one shining moment just makes this final boss fight for me. Then you end up knocking him in the lava. You think he's dead, cause yeah, this fucking lava, how's he gonna survive lava? You get in a helicopter, cause Josh conveniently shows up with Jill. And of course, Wesker's still alive somehow, uses his giant tentacles to grab the helicopter. And you must use two RPGs, cause one RPG's not enough. Two RPGs to finally take out the villain in true Resident Evil fashion. So yeah, overall not much actually happens in the story because the story doesn't really matter. Big surprise. Story doesn't matter in a Resident Evil game. When has it ever? And this kind of brings me to like the thematic changes. Because one of the biggest complaints about Resident Evil 5 is that this was the point where Resident Evil didn't care about horror anymore. And that's true. I mean, I'm not going to deny that even slightly. Whether or not Resident Evil 4 is scary doesn't matter. It still had a lot of moments that were clearly supposed to be scary or at least unsettling. The music was a big part of that. All of the village sections had these creepy themes going that whether or not you were actually scared of a bunch of Spaniards throwing axes at you didn't matter because they were still attempting to have scary moments. And much later in the game, there were generators actually did attempt to inject some horror back into Resident Evil. 5 has nothing like that, at all. While it has liquor betas and those cockroach guys, they're not used in a scary format at all. The liquors all move super slow and just have this weird awkward waddle to them that is not even slightly scary. Not to mention like their weird bulging wedge heads. Instead of just having a brain poking out of a humanoid head, they now have like basically a slab of meat on their forehead and it looks really stupid. And the cockroaches are neat, but they're just not really used correctly. It doesn't help they have these huge glowing weak points that you have to shoot and it just feels too video gamey to be unsettling in any way. And so not even attempting to have a horror atmosphere at any point in the game, especially since most of the game takes place in bright daylight, that's another very non-Resident Evil thing. That's a really legitimate complaint. And if you're somebody arguing that this basically isn't a Resident Evil game, I have to agree with you, at least partially, because of that fact. So what about replayability and bonus content? Well, replayability is pretty high, actually, because you can use the chapter select to pick any level in the game, play it on any difficulty you want to, all of your gun upgrades carry over to any chapter, and if you max out a weapon, you can unlock infinite ammo for it, which does not disable achievements. And the do not disable achievements thing is pretty important, because that's where professional difficulty comes in. Once you beat the game on veteran, you unlock professional, and professional is much harder than Resident Evil 4's professional. They're not even comparable. Professional in this game, almost everything can kill you in one hit. Your bleed out timer is instant, literally burns out in about two seconds. Meaning the AI will not revive you 95% of the time. So you may be wondering, uh, how is that possible with the AI? Well, that's where infinite ammo comes in. All you have to do is give Sheva an infinite ammo magnum and she suddenly becomes way better than any other co-op partner in a video game. Because the only thing she's good at is shooting things and the magnum will kill almost everything in one hit. So it becomes much like Dante Must Die mode in Devil May Cry where you die in one hit and all the enemies die in one hit so it's fair and surprisingly kind of fun for the most part. That being said, it is still very, very difficult in certain points. And of course, since this game released in the age of when DLC started coming out, there is some extra content. Most of it's not free, unfortunately, unlike Resident Evil 4. We have Mercenaries, which is still Mercenaries. Basically, you're dropped in a level with a time limit. You gotta kill as many enemies as possible in that time limit. 
and if you kill certain enemies certain ways you get more points mini bosses are worth more points and you can unlock new levels and you can unlock other playable characters who have their own unique moves and their own unique loadout the only difference in re5 is that you can do it in co-op but you don't have to luckily then we have lost in nightmares which is without a doubt the best of the three Lost in Nightmares is basically a very short chapter explaining what happened to Chris and Jill before RE5 where they went to the Spencer estate to track down Wesker. And essentially it's just one huge nostalgia wank for Resident Evil 1. Because the Spencer estate looks very similar to the Spencer mansion. There are rooms in this estate that look almost exact to rooms in Resident Evil 1. And it's pretty cool. It has a few little minor puzzles in it. It only has one new enemy type, and it's the only enemy that shows up. And he's pretty okay. Basically, you just gotta shoot his eyeball in his back. And if you shoot his globule shit, when you're too close to him, you get hurt by his acid. And it's kind of cool. At least he's like a horror-themed enemy. And at the end, there's a Wesker boss battle that kind of sucks. You basically just stall for time, just like the main game's first Wesker fight and that's it I mean it's pretty good it's only like an hour long and if you like Resident Evil puzzles and you like Resident Evil 5's mechanics it's worth playing if you're buying RE5 you're probably buying the gold edition anyway so you probably will have this so just play it and then the final one is Desperate Escape which honestly is very mediocre it's basically one new level that's huge that you play as Jill right after the boss fight with her in the main game and it explains how her and Josh picked up Chris and Sheva at the very end with the helicopter. And basically you have to fight your way through this huge gauntlet where the game throws literally over a hundred enemies at you. There's a trophy for killing 150 by yourself which I got in the first run. And yeah you just kill enemies there's really nothing more to it. The worst part of it is there's this section where enemies are mounted to these grenade launchers and they can snipe you from basically anywhere. And so it gets really annoying. I don't know, it's okay. If you already like Resident Evil 5's core gameplay, you might as well play it one time, but there's no reason to play it more than once. So at the end of the day, would I recommend Resident Evil 5? Is it a good game? Yes and yes. However, the level of recommendation depends entirely on if you have somebody to play this game with. With a friend, this is a very fun game. I think most games are more fun with co-op anyway, but I think Resident Evil 5 has something special about it that is just a lot funnier with friends. And then you don't have to deal with the horrible AI Sheva, which somewhat detracts from the experience, especially on higher difficulties. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's not a great Resident Evil game, but as a standalone shooter, it's very fun. This is the ideal third-person shooter in my book. You're just fighting monsters, upgrading weapons, going through linear levels, and experiencing weird over-the-top scenes, and the story doesn't matter. I mean, generally, those are all things that cater to my taste, so... That being said, I don't think I would even put it in my top 5 favorite Resident Evil games anymore. It's been edged out in recent years. But it is definitely still worth playing if you're a Resident Evil fan. It has aged surprisingly well. Even graphically, it looks pretty good. So yeah, why not? Check Resident Evil 5 out. It's not even that long. It's like 8 hours long or something. So I would say definitely give it a shot. Speaking of cucks, all these guys just jumped up the ladder and one of them climbed it. <laughs> that guy is a cuck, you're right. 